Hey folks, it's that time again, and uh, it's actually going to be a slightly shorter episode this time. The disturbingly attentive of you might have noticed that it's uh, only going for an hour and a half. Um, that is for reasons, and we'll leave it at that. Um, chat is alive, which is super cool. Let's just see who's lurking. I've definitely seen Jason, Love Like Semtex, and Shimera, Mafanio, and quite a few. Good to see you all. Darius. Uh, Titan Catten? <laughs> Titan Catten. Catten? <laughs> Sorry, man. Um, yeah, welcome. Let's do some stuff. So, a few bits. Uh, today, we're going to be looking a little at um, multi-channel sign distance field text rendering. Uh, basically, the other day, I was uh, chatting to Shimera, who reminded me he has an excellent uh, font library and like font rendering library that everyone should use while we're watching a stream. Uh, which I agree with, and so therefore, for this stream, we're going to do exactly the opposite of that and um, implement something else. And it's mainly actually an opportunity to play with... Um... Well, I've wanted to try this stuff for a while, but we've also got another toy that lurks around in Vario that I'm not sure if you guys have seen yet. Um, and again, it's all based on more of Shimera's work, so it'll be cool to show that off today. Uh, also, it's been a really productive weekend. I um, looked at... I was going uh, through the issue list in the Keppel repo and saw that there, there's been one outstanding there for ages saying add compute. And I've had it like just been ignoring that for the most part because I thought it was going to be a huge amount of work and all kinds of just to integrate it into Keppel and the compiler and things like this. Uh, Shira was saying, now you're just doing this to get on my gears. Yes. Uh, no, man, you do good stuff. Um, but I've got to play with this. It's cool. But yeah, um, I've been putting that thing off forever and I didn't think I was do, doing compute even in 2018 but then I made the mistake of reading the GL documentation and it's really simple it's a single stage pipeline um, and it again all of the all of the API to get information to and from um, compute shaders is really trivial and it's just the how you use them is the complicated part so then that got in my head, and then I was like, well, we really want SSBOs, which are, uh, what is it, shareds, shaders, shared storage buffers, Share, shader storage buffer objects or something like this. Um, they allow you to write out of shaders into big blocks of memory. Um, I thought, well, we'll need those if we're going to do compute, we really should have those. And then I looked at the GL documentation for that, and that was really tiny as well. It's like, oh, fuck, I'm going to have to actually do this now. So yeah, over the weekend, I got that in. I also got um, sync objects in. So, sorry, that's uh, GL fences. So if you've if you're doing some rendering that doesn't have a guarantee um, that the pipeline will wait for something to finish being written. So like if you're writing a transform feedback buffer, you don't know when it's done writing into that. So what you can do is dispatch the call, throw a fence in, and then you can wait for that fence um, to be signaled. And then you're safe to use whatever was being written into that transform feedback buffer. So that's something we need. Also, queries are available in the GL API for things like, hey, how much got written into that transform feedback buffer? And a number of other things. They all exist in Keppel now in master. Um, so that's really cool. I found a bug uh, in Keppel, though, related to how we handle structs and data layout. So basically, I haven't um, implemented standard uh, 140 layout properly. This is about, if you're do using, um, if, you, if you've if you got structs in your shaders um, and it's being backed by some buffer, that data has some layout. And that's dictated by a layout like specifier you can put on the, um, on the block. Without Keppel handling that properly, you get misaligned data. And right now that's what you get. So I need to fix that. So that's gonna be a few weeks out. Um, I'm gonna get that done. Also, it's December. I'm going to be heading back to England to see my family relatively soon. Um, so there's going to be a week or two where I'm definitely not streaming. I'll let you, basically, I'll let you know as, as it happens what's going on there. And I think that's most of the news. I think that's mostly it. I'll, I'll check chat, see what's going on over here. I'm assuming audio video is fine because none of you complained yet. Oh, I was actually on the right computer for once. Let's see, let's see. Thanks for the AV, okay? Good man. Okay. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> Mafania has just realised he doesn't have he doesn't have speakers yet. He's just got a new 4K monitor and the sound isn't working. See you, mate. Sorry about that. <laughs> that is pretty good though. Um... Da, 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 da. There's discussion about emojis, which really don't matter, folks. It's fine. <laughs> right. While that rant continues, uh, we're going to start looking at fonts. So there is a technique. In fact, let me post some links in the chat that we'll be using today. Get this done. We're going to be using this. And this one. Let's just get that in there as well. Paste. Right. So font rendering is surprisingly hard. Um, Part of the difficulty, I, as I understand it, is like basically curves are... So when you're rendering things on the GPU, um, you can do massive amounts of things in parallel, but any time that you want to communicate between um, any kind of pixels on the screen, any invocation to invocations of a specific shader stage, it's going to cost you a lot or is just generally impossible. Um, and this makes it really hard when you're drawing curves because you have to compute the full curve equation for every pixel. And so you have to do all kinds of clever things to, again, limit the region um, where you're actually running the uh, shader in the first place, and, and just a bunch of things to decompose the curve and all this stuff. Um, and it makes fonts very hard to render on the GPU in any kind of efficient way. So one of the common ways... Very sorry about that, one second. One of the very common ways was to make a texture, texture atlas, which basically means you make little textures for... Well, one big texture that contains all of the um, glyphs you're going to be using, all the characters, and then you um, render lots of... Ah, um, oh, blimey, my brain's going. Render lots of quads and you texture those with the characters you need. Uh, laying those out is also a challenge. There are massive libraries dedicated to this kind of thing. It is not a solved problem. But, there, and, and generally, we don't need to be as precise in games. If the text looks stable and good enough, we'll be okay. And um, the folks over at Valve came up with a really nice way of doing this um, using sign distance fields. However, um, yeah, the Valve paper here, this is again, check out the links and you'll be able to find this. Um, and they described a really neat way of doing this with a sign distance function, which really what we're doing is we're storing the distance uh, from the edge of the character at every pixel um, in this in this little glyph here. And with that, we can do some really cool things. We get anti-aliasing for free and all this stuff. Because we're running... Well, because we're going to be doing slightly shorter today, I'm going to try not ramble for too long. But rather than just doing grayscale, this uh, this chap, whoever his name is up here, Shlumsky, um, recognized, of course, you could use um, all three... Like, you could use three components of a vector and store more information essentially and be able to resolve a much nicer um much nicer glyph it's again it's it doesn't fix every case but it fixes a bunch of them it's really cool i've wanted to try it for ages and he's basically provided everything we need so i went ahead and downloaded this and i've built the library and i've um like in its default setup it spits out a character so what we're seeing over here is the texture it produced for the letter A. Okay, so we've got this. And we want to render it. And so we're already rendering this texture to a quad. And down here somewhere, we have some shader codes. This is the GL side of things. GLSL fragment shader, including anti-aliasing. So we're going to take this. And we are going to... Um, yeah, we're going to get it working inside Capel. And then we'll have some basic font rendering. And then there's that other uh, link I post, which was to the um, Atlas generator, which which will produce textures full of these with as many characters as you like. So you can just specify what range of Unicode you want, and it'll dump out a texture with all information, a big old 2048, 2048, for example, um, texture Atlas. And it'll provide all information, of, like lookup information for how to get it out. And we'll look at that soon as well. We uh, Like depending on how much time we've got and if we run into these existing uh, Keppel bugs there might be we might we'll see how far we get we'll see how far we get but what I really wanted to show off is we have a tool that I don't think we've played with before 
um, and it's part of Vario, and it leans um, very heavily on work by Shimera. So the way in his game engine that he does, um, like, yeah, composing uh, shader pipelines is a lot more ambitious than mine, um, but and is very cool. So basically, you write the shaders in GLSL, so it's not in any kind of lispy wrapper. Um, but then what he does is he passes the GLSL and can merge different shaders together and, yeah, combine them in sensible ways. It's a really cool approach. So obviously, pass, part of that is a parser. Um, so we have a parser for GLSL, and I thought it'd be kind of cool if we could just take um, GLSL code and have it spit out Lisp code. So in, in the correct kind of Vario style. So, 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 uh, we're going to do it. Let's see what we've got. So Vario, and this has not had much love on my side. I did, I basically run it through his, um, his parser, and then I do some very simple pattern matching and spit out some stuff. So if you see errors, odds are they're mine. Um, so import GLSL function, oops. And I've got to enable concurrent stuff. Enable concurrent hints. And then what's the, oh yeah, we just have need the GLSL for the function. So I'm hoping we can take this and paste it and we get parser all shaded and not consume all the tokens. No, what did I do wrong? Um, it's likely it failed somewhere around void position zero. Oh, that's rather odd. Let's try the simpler one and see how far we get. It might be that it was only... See, this I just simply can't remember. All right, okay, so we have something here. So, why did it think it... Oh, I see. That's that median symbol is in the Alexandria package. Oh, well. So let's take this. Um, let's drop it down here and remove this. Let's make it lowercase. Let's get rid of that nonsense at the front. And we have a little Lisp version of that function. Um, so, good. We'll just compile that and that's ready to go. Now we've got to work out why main was freaking out. It Could it be something to do with main itself? I don't know. Let's have a look. Otherwise, I'll just have to have a quick peek. Yeah, it didn't, does not like that void, does it? There's, uh, there's a possibility I've got some weird characters in here. It seems I just pasted this off the internet. No, it doesn't seem to be anything right at the beginning. Um, I mean, it's not just having a problem with a simple void itself, is it? Nope. Okay. I wonder what I've done. Let's have a look. Freaks out a void. Hmm. Well, that's Jill's uh, toolkit error. Sorry about that, man. Can you paste me the other snippet and I see what's going on? Sure, dude. Um, well, actually, it's the if you if you look at the link I posted up above, um, the pass error is because it's failing somewhere in the function and unwraps until it can't pass. Oh, okay, gotcha. Um, then we'll oh, if, if it's that, let's let's just see. Oops. Let's just delete some stuff and see how far we get. Right, it likes that. It doesn't like that. So somewhere between there and... So is it the sample? Yes, it's the sample. Okay. Um, it's going to be to do with this, probably. Let's take out the RGB. Nope. Take out the sample. Oh, no. Okay, let's, yeah, it's possible actually, no, uh, let, me, let me see, I've probably got a very old version of DLSL toolkit around here, but no, maybe not, I was worried for a second that, um, GLSL Toolkit. Sorry to do this to you, Shimera. Um, where is this? Nope, that's in Quick Lisp, so that will be relatively up to date. We'll find this. We'll find this bug. Let's, um, let's have a slightly better way of doing this. Um, Yeah, 
Steve on test. Okay. Test. Freaks out. Okay. So it could be freaking out here. Nope. Could be freaking out here. Okay. Doesn't like that line either. So these two lines it's got some issues with. And what I'm seeing in here are both RG and B kind of stuff. So I would have thought that Hmm. If we just took those out, then it will be okay. But it is not. It does not like that at all. So I really should look at the actual chat and see Shimera is probably screaming at me. This is what it is. Okay. It's probably because VEC3 is called sample. Let's give it a go. Oops. Yep, I'm on the right machine. Sam! That's it. There we go. Cool. So. Bam, bam, bam. Bam. And we've got to reintroduce the RGB here. Cool. There we go. That's all we need. Good enough. Good enough. Thanks, Shin. Good catch. Sorry for making you do that <laughs> on a stream. Right. Let's get rid of this nonsense. So anyway, way it works, this is a really handy tool. It's just, I mean, a lot of the time just for getting things into um, Keppel faster if you've got existing code. Keppel does also support inline GLSL stages. Um, if you want an example of that. Wow, what am wrong with my typing? What, what do I mean? I'm like this every week. Um, if you want an example, you can clone the keppel.examples repo, and in there you can find um, an inline GLSL example, which shows a very simple fragment stage um, being done inline, and there is also a tessellation inline uh, GLSL stage, and this one has a ton of inline GLSL. Um, so yeah, it can work, it is not the most tested part of Keppel. Uh, because I prefer writing in Lisp, so I don't do this. But all this uh, does work with live recompilation as well. So anytime you recompile this form, it'll um, update like everything else. Sweet. Okay, so we've got these now. So this should be the, um, what is this? Uh, Multi-sign, multi-channel sign, distant field frag. And it takes no arguments. That's strange. You would think it would take something. Um... That's a good point, actually. It probably... Oh, yeah, no, of course it doesn't, because it's expecting a lot of things to be passed in as uniforms. I'm going to bring this back in again, because I was an idiot for getting rid of it so quickly. But let's just comment it, and do a bit of tidying, and then we're going to have a look at our inputs. So, it is expecting something called position, which is going to be a VEC2. Um, of course, the out is going to be a color, but that's automatic, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, we're going to say and uniform. Uh, oh yeah, it's outputs color, so we can get rid of this setf color, because basically our implicit return from our function is going to be the output color. And let's see what else we need to pass in. So uniform, we need a uh, px range, which is a float. Don't know why I couldn't see it there. Right, we need a BG color, which is a VEC4. We need a foreground color, which is a VEC4, and I think that's it. Let's try compiling this, and it's freaking out, going MSDF is undefined. Okay, what didn't I do? MSDF, oops, not NS, MSDF. Cool, there's a symbol here. Oh yeah, that's the, that's the sampler 2D, of course, the most important part. Uh, msdf is sampler 2d. It's dash 2d, isn't it? And there is no applicable method. Um, okay, this is a problem with my translator. So that vario import thing, like I said, doesn't do a great job yet. So it's picked the wrong um, constructor function here, I think. Let's have a look. There's no applicable method for v2. Where's that? Oh, 
when when called with argument types IVEC2. Why does it think it's an Oh texture size. Okay, yes. So that's odd. That should actually accept that. Okay. So that's not ideal. Oops, one second. Get rid of that. So it means that um, my specification for VEC2 in my compiler has not got enough overloads. So we're going to do this in a really stupid way. Um, oh, we're not going to use SAM. We're already using that. Um, raw. Let's just go to raw. And it's going to be X of raw and Y of raw. And I think that then converts. What am I doing wrong there? There's no applicable method for GLSL function divide uh, when called with float and vec2. Ah, yes, that's, uh, again, limitations I've put on things. Um, swizzle form invalid RGB. I Yes, again, that's my stuff. I prefer XYZ. I really should add RGB in the others, but I've just been lazy. Right, so now that actually compiles, except it's complaining about the R function. Yes, okay, so we're going to look for R because I don't have that as a function, so... G and B will be Z. Okay, so it's not liking the malt F function. That's very strange. But I can, yes, we can deal with that. I'm pretty sure I had that in. Oh yes, of course, things have uh, moved around a bit now. Let's see, let's get rid of this. And hopefully I could have just removed that symbol. Oh, we've got another divide down here. Okay. Right, now it compiles. Groovy. So not the most elegant way to get stuff in, but a lot of the time it beats copying out, especially when the especially when the thing is very large. So, let's see if we can use this now. I'll put it up here. Put a little bit of stuff so I can see where I am. Right, and now we need to make ourselves a pipeline. So def pipeline G, um, we're gonna have MSDF as the name of the pipeline. We're not gonna have anything special in the arguments and we are going to, actually, we're gonna basically copy what we've got up here. So we are gonna render points because now, we're, now we have access to a single stage pipeline, we can just use the same as we're already doing. So fragment is going to be MSDF frag um, and compile, that's not right, of course, because it takes a vector. There we are, that compiles. And then, then we've got some things to provide. So, let's just put a helper function here called use msdf. Um, we're going to take, I'll well, we'll work out the arguments in a minute. So let's do map G. We're going to do MSDF. That's the pipeline. We are going to pass in um, the sampler, which is some sampler. We're going to pass in the pixel range. So what's that being used for? Um, I think there might be some information on this on here or in the. Let's have a look. Oh, oh changes to. Firefox screwing me over. Okay. Range specifies the width of the range around the shape between the minimum, maximum represented sign distance in the shapes. Okay, so what is the default for that? Um, let's go and see if the thing will tell us. So I'm just, I, so before the stream, I compiled this and got a few things ready, like making this texture, because um, I was worried about time. So let's look at MSDF gen, and in here, there's MSDF gen, it's probably lurking around somewhere. Yep, minus help, that's a lot of information, and range, and it sets, okay, so it says sets the width, but it doesn't tell us what the default is, that's a bit of a shame. Um, wonder what it would be. I don't even know. Specifies the width of the range around the shape between the minimum and mac maximum representable signed distance in shape units. 
or distance field pixels respectively. I mean, I suppose we can just try with zero and see what we get. <laughs> we can mess with that value and see. So PX range um, is zero. We've got a background color of um, black and a foreground color of white. Is there anything else we need? Pixel range, MSDF. Oh yeah, of course we need to pass up us in our stream, um, which at the moment is our buffer stream variable, or some bullshit. Right, so now we can comment this out, and if I get back to my REPL and CLS, okay, so now nothing's being drawn, and now we go use MSDF, and still nothing is being drawn. Hooray! Okay, so we're clearly doing something wrong, and we're going to have to find out what it is. Mm. Okay, questions in the chat. Shimera is saying he's not actually sure if that shade is valid. Yeah, it's probably some, um, it's probably illegal according to the spec and valid according to some slightly too permissive implementations. Arwakode, oh wow, uh, did we get a list to shader code? Of course, yeah, at any point. Actually, I think I saw someone explain that. Um, yeah, more conversation about the odds that it's actually probably... Uh, Emifani is saying, oh, odd, considering it worked for, both, for me on both Intel and NVIDIA. Dude, like, it, it doesn't matter if all of them support it. There'll always be one place that doesn't. Uh, you find this uh, often with... Um, so one bug I got tripped up for ages was that when you're using uh, shared contexts, FBOs are not shared, um, but they are on a lot of implementations, and I mean a lot. It, I had to find a, an old, it was an old mobile phone, um, and yeah, it was, what was it? With some shitty GPU inside it, and they actually implemented the spec correctly and weren't sharing FBOs across contexts. It worked everywhere else. Um, and it really is just like, if it was easier for them to do it, I mean, like they're being more permissive than the spec requires them to be. So it works, but that is no way. It's like C++. You can't try something and say, oh, that's the behavior because you might be un in undefined behavior territory. And undefined behavior has its benefits, especially in this kind of field where we don't want to be checking the validity of everything because that costs us cycles and everything about this is about performance. So, um, you know. It's a it's it's a trade off, but yeah, trying things in GLSL and is not a good way to say that's what the spec says should happen. Um, and Shimera saying he wants to focus on yeah, rather than making it more lenient, focus on some of the more important stuff, which is yeah, totally valid. Um, Arakodi, oh yeah, that's um, so yes, all of. So, uh, so Arakodi was saying, I was just surprised to see that, that there was a Lisp to Shader Code compiler. Yeah, so there's a couple of projects in play here. There's a project called Vario, which is my little compiler, which takes lists um, that, that are going to contain Lisp code, and, or a subset of common Lisp, and compiles them to GLSL. And then there's Keppel, which uses that compiler and then does all the... Um, wrangling of the GL API to make it feel nice and to make it nice to interact with from the REPL and from Lisp in general. So we have an excellent CL OpenGL library, um, which exposes um, common Lisp, exposes OpenGL to common Lisp. But the, it, again, it doesn't make OpenGL pretty. <laughs> and so you have to kind of deal with its weirdness. And so Keppel is an effort to make that nice. There's lots of valid kind of ways of doing that. But in here, at any point you want to see the code, which is exactly what I want to do now, we can say pull G, which you can use on buffers and array, on GPU buffers, GPU arrays, and a bunch of other things. Um, we're going to use it to pull down the compiled code. So let's pull down MSDF, and it's not pulling anything down. That's rather nasty. What's going on here? I get the feeling that something isn't running. 
Have I been an idiot? I think I have. Oh. Something's going on. Right, one second. I have been a Muppet around here somewhere. Let me just fix some, some code. Primitive. Um, this should be points. Reset. Not reset one, Chris. What are you typing? I uh, bought that. Reset. Continue. Right, cool. We're back to our texture. Now if we do this, we compile. It's complaining. Ah, it's complaining about something very valid. Um, but this is not a float. Continue. Okay. This is not quite what... Oh, holy crap. Yes, that worked. Damn. All right. And we're going to go and modify our UVs. So we're going to say that um, POS is... Oh, it's just copy it from up above. We've got this from another day. Doot, doot. Oh yeah, of course, the symbol's not called UV here, it's called POS. And... Hold on there. Symbol UV. Oh god, I've done UV in two places. Idiot Chris! There we go, that's what I was expecting. Okay, so we got the letter A, and it has very hard edges. I was hoping that the anti-aliasing on this would be better. Um, maybe that's related to one of those numbers we're passing in. So let's try this pixel range and stick in it at 10. And that blurred it all to hell. Okay, so that's no good. One? No, that's, uh, so this does seem to want to be zero. Um, then this could actually be in the source image. What is nice about this, of course, is we're getting just a really well-drawn letter. So from... From this... To this which is really good so, and this will work at different scales which is really nice so uh, yeah that's a good start but rendering one letter is boring and so we're gonna want to do more what are we at now we're at 8 30 that leaves us another hour to do some things which is cool so the second link I threw in the chat is from here MSDF uh, MSDF Atlas gen and the idea of this is gonna pack um, a whole range of uh, those kind of side distance filled characters into one texture. Um, it seems to be excellent. I pulled this down on uh, Linux and was able to build it straight away. And so if we go and look, let's um, go to, where would it be? Code C++, um, MS Gen, Atlas Gen, there we go. Cool. So in the out folder, I tested this, and you run it. Let's, let's just, I'll, I'll show you running it. I know it's kind of pointless, but here we are. We're in, already in the Atlas Gen folder. Um, we will go and do this. We call Atlas Gen. We tell it the range of um, Unicode characters that we want in this thing. I'm just saying the first 500. Uh, the size of the texture we're going to produce. So, um... Let's do, let's make it slightly bigger. Whoops. Let's say 1024 by 1024, because we're not memory limited in any way here. And the font that we're going to use. So we're going to use Roboto Regular. And if we do this, it's going to chew for a while, and it's going to dump out some stuff. And the things it dumps out are just cool. So let's get rid of this. We have this PNG. With, there's our signed distance field stuff all packed together. It's, again, the packing is squeezing all those characters into as small a space as possible so we um, we can use as much of this texture as we can. And we can see here some like there's capital A and there's some with different symbols above them and various things like that. There's a question mark and that's all very cool. So this looks promising. But of course we need to know where in this texture everything is if we're going to read out of it. So there is another file, let's close this, it's called bitmap font description, which normally dumps all the, so it's dumping out all this information. As you can see, this looks very familiar. I, um, originally this was dumped out, obviously with commas between everything and curly braces. I just went and changed a tiny bit of the C. Um, so 
I just, yeah, I've made it so it's going to be straightforward to use from Lisp, which is cool. So let's go and back to our project. Da, da, da. Play with that. I'll do font info dot Lisp. Um, and we'll do this. We'll say in package. What are we doing? So this is uh, play with verts. And we're going to do def var. And this is a uh, temp info because we're going to process this a bit before we uh, try and pass it up to the GPU. Put a quote there. Remove these horrible trailing things because we don't like those. Compile that. Cool. So now if we go to the REPL and we look at temp info, we'll see a whole bunch of numbers and lists. That's great. So jumping back to the C code again. Bitmap font description. Da -da -da -da. This is the layout we're interested in. So we're going to have to make an array that, like, we'll have to make some data that's going to be in this layout. And this is where I think we might run into some problems with Keppel and its uh, and its issues with how it's packing structs and stuff. We'll see. We'll see how we go. But I'm, oh, I'm pretty sure we're going to run into bugs. But that's fine. That's fine. Right. I think that's all we need from here. Um, I'm not sure what this is used for yet. Smooth pixels is two. I don't know what that means. We'll come back to this. I believe there's also some information on um, what all these terms mean. Uh, in fact, I'm pretty sure that's in the original repo. We'll go find that soon. Um, but yeah, I think this is. I think this is a good start. Ace. So, what do we want to do? Oh yeah, we need to go copy that um, texture as well, right? Let's go into out, and we have the bitmap font image. So let's move this over to play with that, and we're going to call it atlas.png. Done. We're going to make sure we can load it, because that's going to be disappointing if we can't. Atlas.png. There we go. We're ready to go there. Um, let's make ourselves a variable. Yeah, let's go and do that in the other file. So we'll do play with Bert's list, and we'll just dump it in here somewhere. Def var um, atlas sampler is going to be nil to begin with, and then let's bring up the REPL, and then later on it's going to be text atlas. So we will set this up here in our reset function. Atlas Sambler is going to be text atlas. Good. And then let's just do that to make sure that variable is set. So we can play with it later. Cool. All right, so far so good. Um, next thing, what is the next thing? Oh yeah, we need to get all that um, font information up to the GPU. So we're going to make a new struct that works on the GPU and CPU. Um, and it's gonna be called, yeah, well, Still the same name, bitmap, glyph. And it is going to, what are we gonna do? Yeah, we'll just start with this. Say um, atlas x is an int, atlas y is an int, atlas width and height. A rule, all oh, the unsigned integers, so let's go and fix that. Okay, so we do minix, there's a float, and y. So we got max x, max y, cool, and the advance, which I think is the distance to the next character. Compile that, that compiles, that's fine. Now, we want to keep all of this information on the GPU. Like, so we're gonna run, what we're gonna do is we're gonna render a lot of quads. And then for each one, we're gonna render a glyph into it. And so I think we're gonna need all of this information available probably as a UBO. 
It's a uniform buffer object, so we can store a load of stuff in a GPU array and then make that available as a, a, as a uniform that we can query. Um, let's have a look. And Arakodi is asking, uh, any plans to deal with kerning? I mean, not myself. I'm hoping other libraries are going to do that for me. Um, I remember using free type and having to compute kerning distances between lips. Oh, fuck that. Yeah, so um, I think this uses free type. Um, I'm hoping it's going to give me that kind of information. Otherwise, that's something for another day. I'm, I'm not really interested. I mean, for, for my projects, I really need this for just debug information. And there I'm fine with it being monospace. In fact, that's preferable to me. Um, for actually rendering stuff in games, we'll deal with that later. A lot of the time you haven't got like fast changing text in a game unless your game's about that kind of thing. But um, yeah. And uh, Shimera's library's libfond, which uh, I would remember, except I'm just so bad at that kind of thing. Okay, so I think FreeType is doing a lot of magic to read the kerning table inside the font TDF file and handling all the parsing and math. I just call the function that takes two glyphs and give you back a width in virtual coordinates. That's interesting. And Shimera's talking about that FreeType, in his opinion, has too many dependencies, which is probably true, yeah. And so libfont only uses stb true type, which is a header only pretty much. Oh, I love SD. The SDB single header file libraries are just so cool. They're just brilliant. So I'm really glad, yeah, that's all wrapped up. Um, but yeah, pretty sure it does no kerning or per character distance info. Again, that'll be fine for what I need it for. So I might end up using that in the end as well, which would be cool. But I really wanted to have a look at this. So it's cool to be doing it. Okay. What next? What next? Yeah, so we're going to need a UBO, which means we're going to need a... Oh, am I on the wrong machine? Whoops. Our code STB. Yes. Right, so we're going to need another um, thing called... We're just going to call it glyphs. Or... Yeah, doesn't matter. Just use that. And then inside here, we're going to have... Oh no, so um, we'll call it, the, we'll call this type, yeah, I'll oh, we'll just call it font atlas. It really doesn't matter what it's called, Chris. Just pick something. Okay, and then in here we'll call this glyphs, and its type is going to be an array of bitmap glyphs, and I, I've just got a feeling we're about to run into a bug. I can feel it. 500, what am I doing that in the code? Um... Oh, yeah, that smells like a problem. Hmm, me. Undefined variable? That doesn't sound good. Wait a second. Have I got a bug in here? Yep, there it is. Make C array from pointer bitmap glyph. That should have a quote in front of it. Right, let's go fix that now. Um... So that is the accessor... have a look where are you actually what was that ah. got the macro expand still open slime macro expansion here it is okay so make c array from pointer that's going to be the best way to find this here it is and element type there should have a quote in front of it i think that's it i think that's the only instance of make c array from pointer cool compile that Still complains. Oh no, it says redefining. And now no errors. Good. Okay, so that's that's better than I thought. Um, next step. What is the next step? So the next step is to go and commit that to capital. Because that actually matters a lot. Uh, in fact, that's gonna be a that's gonna make a that's gonna make a huge difference. Um, let me kick this over to master. I think we can get away with that. And Yes. Station commit everything. And we go devstruct g um, 
making accessors with unquoted type names. Cool, so that's that. Now the question is, is this also on the release branch? Because then we need to fix it before uh, it goes out in Quicklisp, because that would be very annoying. So we have structs. When was the last time I was dealing with structs? Which is down here. Freeze defense struct type, no. Freeze declarations, struct pipeline state, no. We did some work on def struct recently, I'm pretty sure. That was when we were removing a dependency on auto wrap. So let's uh, feature move away from auto wrap here. Cool. I think this is, yeah, remove auto wrap and plus C dependencies. Right, so this one really depends where our quick lisp um, branch is right now. So I guess we should have a look at that. Let's just jump over to, well, let's push this to master anyway, because that needs to go up. Um, and let's go to release quick list and check here. Um, and then we'll look for auto wrap, which is not here. Cool. So we haven't got rid of the dependency on that branch, which means we're fine. Okay, nothing to worry about there. Um, that is good. Yeah, so we have a lot of features rolling out in the next few uh, months for Keppel. Actually, this is a good enough time to talk about that in general. So as well as obviously me being away for a bit, um, I've been throwing in a bunch of features. I've been finding bugs. I'm pretty sure that I'm going to have to make one more breaking change to Keppel with regards to um, data serialization between the Lisp and the um, CFFI and GPU stages. So that initial, the way I do structs at the moment is, um, well, we'll see actually. Like if I, if I have some... If I was to populate a struct, let's see what a good example of that would be. Let's make a temp struct. I was going to say fubar, but now it's goobar. That's okay. So we're going to have x, which is a float, and y, which is a float. And then in in Keppel, we're going to make a an sorry an array with one of these. And so if I want it to automatically marshal the data over for me, what I can do is I can say, I'll obviously have to tell it the element type, which is going to be uh, Gooba. And then inside here, I'm gonna put the floats. So here we go. And you can see I'm putting them in lists, right? And so what, um, and th I did that originally, obviously, because I was, again, I was newer at Lisp and Lisp lists were obviously incredibly convenient, but I hadn't done it many experiments with the other data types and really got a feel for what would be right in this situation. Um, so if I do this, we can see that we have uh, this C array now. So let's just stick this in a temp bar, temp zero. And I can access elements. Now when I do, it returns this object. And this is a handle. It doesn't have a print uh, func method defined for it at the moment, but that's just my branch. Um, this is a pointer into this foreign array and it was doing that so we didn't have to marshal data backwards and forwards all the time but the more i've used this the more i've come to think that i should actually just have this define a lisp struct well a lisp type as well and actually do the marshalling every time we pull a value out because it's more convenient and this is not a fast way of like even even using this there's a limit to how fast i can make it um and I've done an okay job, I think, but yeah, basic, basically it's processing the data in this way um, has performance implications. And it's about to get more complicated because DefStruct soon is gonna have an option for specifying layout. So it could be like standard uh, 140 or standard 430. So when I define this, like, do I require you to specify a layout or do I generate a type for all of the different layouts and let you just specify on the arrays? I definitely want to do the latter. I don't want you to have to make a new version of this struct for every different layout. But with that, that means that when you get back this wrapper type and you go to access one of the uh, members, so let's just do this. If I do Gooba, um X on that last one, it's going to return the one. But with different layouts, these 
uh, values are going to be at different offsets inside the data structure. And so I'm worried there that it's going to make it just a lot more difficult to make this fast. It's another another piece of indirection um, because I can't. Uh, I just can't. I don't think I, I'm able to be going to be able to get the speed I want from CFFI. So another option is again I every time every time you're working with things in Lisp you're going to be using regular old Lisp data types. So accessing this is going to give you a, a piece of Lisp data and that will mean copying backwards and forwards all the time. Um, and then I'm going to give better tools for working with the data straight on top of the pointers, basically, without marshalling in the same way, without marshalling entire structs. So it'll use an effective like destructuring bind and things like this. So anyway, I, I'm kind of going on a ramble, but the, the thing is, there's a very good chance that there is going to be a breaking change to the API of Keppel in January. Um, and that I'm hoping is the last one. Um, we're running out of big GL features that Keppel needs. Um, there's definitely some candidates. They're all kind of GL 4.4 and up, 4.3, 4.4 and up. Um, they're the latest, greatest stuff for getting all of the speed you can out of, um, out of GL. I don't think there's much that's gonna break the API of Keppel, basically. I think we're getting very close for, for, to something that won't have to change dramatically. But this last one I think is gonna bust us. So expect that I will make a branch, which is kind of the last one before the big change. Um, so if you have existing code and you're worried about it breaking, I mean, I know there's like, what, five people actually using this in the real world, but you know, I, I don't wanna I don't wanna leave you up shit creek and all that. So that's what's gonna happen. Um, I'll keep you posted as it does. So anyway, I've rambled on for another while here. Oh, we've got like 40 minutes left. Cool, right, okay, let's do something. This compiled, which was cool. And now we're going to make a GPU array um, with the font atlas type. So element type, um, the initial content is going to be nil. The element type is going to be font atlas. And the dimensions are actually just going to be one. So we've got that. Therefore, atlas. Um, oh, I'll just call it Atlas Glyphs. I'm all over the place with the names. But we have some results, which is good. So let's go back to the other file and make sure we keep this code. I don't want to lose it. Feel free to shout out questions if that last ramble was confusing as well, because I realize I went off on one a bit there. Um, cool. Now we need to upload all this data into that GPU array. Um, what's the best way of doing that? Well, actually, oh, I wonder if, I wonder if, if we had done this and we just said temp info, Oof, didn't like that. Dimensions are invalid for initial contents. Oh, okay, fair enough. Yes, that actually makes a lot of sense. It Because this has a whole shit ton of things in it. Um, and we want it to see what happens if we wrap it in list. Dimensions of array differ from that of the data. It wants 500, we've given it that. Yes, we have. So let's wrap it in another list. This is the thing, this kind of, um, this is the kind of stuff I don't like. The fact that we want to talk about structs, but we're packing things in, Lisp and, in lists and then pouring them in. They're just, lists are just not the right data structure for this kind of data. So yeah. Oh, it's not liking this. Okay, never mind. Um, so let's do something else. Let's uh, go find our GPU array again. And we're just going to pull it down to a C array. If I would actually pull the thing. Um, we're going to set up our temp to be that. Because we're going to work with this. Then we're going to do something. Let's have a look. So let's get... The first element of temp zero. 
which is this font atlas thing here. And then we're going to put loads of data into it. So we're going to go and get the font atlas glyphs member. And that's this C array, which is good. Um, and that's what we're going to populate. So loop for AX, AY, AW, AH, and X. Oh. X, X. Oh, what is it going to be? Yeah, min X, max X, min Y, max Y, advance. In, temp info, and then do. What are we going to do? We are going to set up a bunch of things. So we are going to roll over this. At the same time, we're going to increase accounts. So we're going to say for i from zero. And we're going to be talking about this array. So let's just stick that in another temporary variable for a minute. So def var temp2 um, is this. Let's put this down a new line just for our sanity. We're talking about sanity, we're writing a big ass loop from the, on the REPL itself, but never mind. It'll work. So bitmap glyph atlas x. And oh yeah, so we need one more for for lm equals arefc of temp2 i. Oh, what a mess. What a mess. I from zero and then do. Lm is going to be ax. Bitmap clip access. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna hammer this out for a minute. So I'm not gonna say everything I'm doing because it's just gonna be tedious to listen to. So what are we doing? Atlas W. Oof. Height. Why am I doing this all from the REPL? It'd be so much nicer in the file. In fact, I'm gonna do that because it is just I'm gonna hit return at the wrong time and mess the whole thing up. Okay, right. Oh yes, uh, now I can't see the definition. Here we go. Min x, max x, whoops. I mean min x like this. And it's not a w here, it's a h. And this is min x, and this is max x. This is y and y. Delilah. What else? And advance. Ooh. What the hell? I'm guessing, yes, none of these should have been Atlas. Ah. And that's just A. Cool. So that's the foo function. So hopefully if we ran foo now, oh, it just breaks. Okay, so there is no applicable method function for populate when cooled with zero, zero. Oh, well, that's just dandy. What have we got going on there? Oops. Temp zero, temp one. No, it wasn't temp one. It was temp two because I have a great counting system. Yes, I agree that everything accounting starts at zero, but then it immediately jumps to two. Smart, Chris. Good stuff. Shimera is saying, "Sabagi, when are you going to start on uh, work on STDB TrueType and add SDF to it?" 
Man, it just sounds... I was so happy with finding this because I just find font rendering to be such a horrible problem. Font layout and all that kind of stuff is just the most disgusting kind of problem because it's so human. None of the problems... Like, so many... Well, so many of the problems aren't technical. There's a load of technical problems, like the curve rendering stuff, very interesting. But all the rest of it is just, like, Unicode and... Oh, it's just riddled with human stuff. Like, it, it's so unsatisfying. So I, I, I won't be doing that. I want to... God, I hope that someone else is going to do that for me. Um, Shamira is saying, I changed the REPL to only run a form if you hit return at the end of the form or if you hit uh, control return. That's nice. Yes. I need that. Throw, Please throw a link to your... Uh, is your configuration anywhere public? Because I would love to steal that. Because that really fit, fits in with a lot of the chat things I use anyway. Um... Oracody, yes, font rendering is so subjective you can't test case it. Well, yeah, I mean, like, testing rendering is a bitch anyway. I mean, like, I mean, you can't just diff pixels and say, oh, if it's the same, then we succeeded. It just doesn't, it's, that's not a robust approach. So all of it is just ah, beginning to end. Nightmare. Nightmare! So what kind of idiot am I today? Why is this not working? So let's do nothing, right? Really? Oh, I found nil. Doesn't like nil. Okay. Right nil. <laughs> Exciting. Right, there we go. So it definitely was in the setf stuff. Miles. So what's it unhappy about? We've got uints. Let's just see if... Again, we might be about to find another Keppelberg. Let's see. Oh, it doesn't like the uins. Why is that? What an odd thing to be angry about. Oops. Right, so it returns it fine. But if I set F this one it freaks out oh that's awesome good job me what have i done there hmm oh wait this zero could be the index and this could be oh no what have i done what have i done if i make this two no it's still zero and one. Oh, that's even weirder What is this? What's this? What's this? There's something in the air. It's bullshit. And it's coming out of me. Right. Um, so this is just a problem. Something's calling populate and that sucks. So this should be set F. Yeah. Okay. So it's calling populate with Methinks I've messed up some of my refactorings of how structs work recently. So there might be stuff that is wrong on master. Yeah, I haven't merged that those changes into Quicklist, as we saw earlier. So the next release is still safe, but I need to clean this before the release after that. What is I? What am I doing? This, yeah, this is going to actually pull the value itself. So then... Pfft. Yeah, that, that simply makes no sense. Okay. That is strange. Trying to work out in what way this would make sense. <sighs> this would probably make sense if it thinks the element is an array. So why is it doing it for this unless I've got those backwards? Seems very odd. Seems very odd. We could check that by going and looking here and seeing if the axis of a glyphs 
Slow off going look at setf for glyphs. Nope, that's calling populate as well. What have I done? Oh, okay, I'm kind of, I, it's actually working out to be kind of good that this is going to be a shorter stream because I think we're not going to get everything done that we wanted. Um, because if we're going to start just getting into the nitty gritty Keppel nonsense bugs, then I don't think that's going to be a lot of fun. Right. Da -da -da -da. Setters. Yeah, this is the problem. It's using, it's using populate here. But populate isn't a macro, it's a method. So it isn't working on that form, it's working in a result of this form. I don't see how that's right. Let's use a little bit of magic. When did I change this? Very... Oh, no. That one's been there a while. 2016, so that has been working at some point. Um, this is strange. Or maybe, maybe it hasn't working. Maybe I just haven't been using structs of structs. Or even... I've definitely been populating structs of a bunch of values. What have I done? What have I done? Right, so now let's look at something that's very recent like here. Um, time name. Yeah, I'm not seeing it. Okay. We'll have to put that down as a loss for now. Damn. Okay, so. If we can't make... Um, if we can't do this, then making a UBO is going to be rather a pain in the backside. Um, we really need to be able to make an array uh, full of structs. And if that's not working, then we're not going to get our atlas working. And I don't think hacking on Keppel to get that into shape is a good idea right now. Because it's just going to be me mumbling at the screen and trying to work out A, what, like how to fix it, which is, shouldn't be too hard. But then why it got like this and when, because I'll need to know that. So I think I'm going to abandon the idea of doing proper Atlas rendering. We've got this, which is okay. You know, it's not, it's, it's an A. I mean, it's like... Is not what I wanted to get done tonight. So what I'll do instead is open up and uh, just say, what should we play with? Um, like, is there any questions regarding Keppel, regarding Vario, um, stuff you want to see, things to do with the import, things to do with upcoming features, anything at all? I'm kicking it open. Otherwise, I, I may call this stream off even earlier than usual, which I'm very sorry to do because um, I don't really want that. It would also be nice to I'm wondering if there's any whoa 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 now we got memory faults oh it's all going on okay so while your questions come in <laughs> we'll fill this awkward silence with me reloading everything Oof. shimera is saying the uh the control return is already covered by slime. Oh, sick. So I just have to enable it? Bad ass. I have to remember to put these links in the video today. Set slime repl return. Oh, cool. Nice, man. Thank you very much. Nice. Okay. Jace is saying I've been keeping an eye on compute shaders for a while. Love to see something. Uh, love to see something there. Yeah, it's fun. So, yeah, compute shaders are kind of cool. There's very little to them, especially not when I'm on the wrong computer. Um, let's get out of that and jump back over here. So, compute shaders are going to look something like this in Keppel. So, um, compute shaders don't take input arguments. Um, in the same way as our vertex stages and things like that do. They're not allowed these kind of arguments. 
Um, so they would be called varying arguments, ones that change with every element. So for a vertex shader, they'll be with every vertex, for a fragment shader with every fragment, varyings. But they do take uniforms, ones that are the same inputs for every invocation of the stage. They also don't return anything. They don't have a like a fixed output. So a vertex stage's output is going to be fed into the next stage. It's going to be, again, modified or augmented vertex uh, information. That's going to flow into the next stage and or into a, a transform feedback buffer, which stuff we've already looked at. But again, compute doesn't have that. They expect you to write out using other mechanisms, um, either using SSBOs, which I'm in the process, like which are supported now in master, but don't work because of the um, struct bugs. Um, that I can I can actually show you some of the data from there. So the only thing that really what that means for um, Keppel is we have some compute func. Right? We can have some uniforms, doesn't matter what they are. Normally it's going, and, and, and some of the, we're going to have to have somewhere to write our results. So result might be, say, a big um, SSBO full of vector threes. So we can say it's a big bunch of vector threes. Um, how will we do this? Now, it wouldn't just be a vector three, would it be a right? So yeah, it's, let's just say it's some data, so, like some big. Actually, how have I done this? I need to look. I, I've only written the. I, I wrote up a, some details on it. Oh yeah, okay, fair enough. So yeah, I'll actually just copy this and we'll go from here. We'll define a struct which has a bunch of places to write things, we will make a uniform of that type. Now, if you wanted to use a um, some kind of buffer-backed uniform, normally you would say something like UBO, and this will tell Keppel that you're going to bind a buffer um, and pass it in as a uniform to be read from. But in the future, or as of right now, you can write SSBO, and then we can write into this. So then we can say, set of uh, bar data of result and then we can do bar oh no what is it oh then we can do a ref and some index and we can write values in there and then because like i said it returns no values you have to specify that it's a void function by writing values at the end and that's it that is a valid that that will be a valid compute shader, um, and then what you can do is you can say def pipeline um, yay compute, and instead of uh, saying fragment or vertex, you just say compute, and then you say some compute func, and because there are no um, there are only uniform arguments which we don't include in our signatures for overloading. Um, it means that every compute function is going to have a different name. You can't overload compute functions, which means you don't have to specify the arguments specifically here. We've we've relaxed the um, requirements there. And like I say, this is already in master, but it's kind of useless until we get layout fixed to make our SSBOs useful. Um, apparently as well, there was a feature in GL, which I, I definitely haven't implemented yet, and that's the ability to write into images from textures which just seems crazy i mean i might even go look at it in a minute because it's kind of kind of odd the only other difference i suppose for the compute is that um when you map over it when you uh, which will be the same you just use map g just like before normally you pass in some vertex uh stream here so vert stream um like we do here we pass in bs which uh, if we look at it <laughs> oh, it's all going so well. Right. Um, if we look at it, this is going to have some bugs as well. Let's do this. Oh no, things are fucked. Font Atlas. No, let's get rid of that. We don't need that right now. Retry. Okay. If we look at it, we can see it's a buffer stream. Compute shaders 
don't work on streams of vertices. They work on a number of invocations. You say, hey, I want to run this this many times. Or more precisely, what you do is you say, make compute space. And then you can provide up to three dimensions of compute. So right here, we're just going to do um, 100 invocations. Um, so this is how many groups of invocations of this stage there are going to be. There's one more detail, um, and it's we have to do a declaration. And what is it called? Local size. And we have to say how many invocations are going to happen per group. So this is saying there are 100 groups, and this is saying one invocation per group. Um, what you'll actually be doing is tuning that to something sensible. And uh, so you might say you might actually have 10 invocations per group and then, sorry, 10 invocations, yeah, locally, and then we'll set a number of groups. We'll go into more details of this as um, the feature matures and as we can start playing with it and documenting it. But having this in Keppel is a big win for me. I'm, I'm really chuffed. It's one more step towards covering the complete GL API. And there are a bunch of effects that are more interesting these days that are using compute. Like there's some really nice depth of field things you can do once you can turf some of the processing over to compute, um, especially with the near field. So I'm at work, I'm chatting with my mate about that kind of stuff all the time. So he's gonna be doing some more experiments on his project. He's a Rust dude. So he's working on his demo engine and it's very interesting doing some near field stuff with compute. Anyway, so that's uh yes, Jace, I have a, we are, we're, we're getting there, we're getting there. Um, it's all coming along. Uh, so in in this week's uh, blog post that I did, I, I kind of go through this a little, saying about mapping a compute space and passing in an SSBO. Um, when I tried this down here, so like, let me just look at this, um, look at this shader. I mean, it's really dumb. All we're doing is we're saying we get the work group ID, which is going to be a vector three and it's based on our compute space. So we said we're going to have, uh, we're going to, we're going to make 10 work groups. So they're going to be numbered from zero to 10, but because this is three dimensional, it's also one in the X coordinate, sorry, one in the Y coordinate and one in the Z coordinate. So we take the X index, which is between zero and 10, make it an int, use it as the index into this array. And we set the values in this array to um, the ID and then we finish. Now, when I pulled this data back, I found this, these really big gaps. We've got four elements here and then three elements before the next one, three elements before the next one. This is all down to, uh, Keppel not handling layout properly because a VEC three array is, so what is it? What have we got here? An int array, um, the alignment of the elements of the array is actually to vec4. So that's that was rather confusing, um, which is why there are three elements here. The fact that there are four elements here, I think is actually down to a bug in NVIDIA's driver. Um, a lot of implementations seem to get vector three wrong. Um, oh yeah, wait a sec. Yes, they get, no, that's, sorry, that's something separate. The four at the beginning here, I'm not sure what's going on there. That's probably another kept fuck up in Capital. Again, all of that stuff will go away once I get layout right. Um, SSBOs. In fact, we could just run this. Let's let's copy this in. Rather than dummy code that I had just a second ago. Do this. Do that array. This compute function. This pipeline. Um, and then let. We'll need an SSBO. So this can wait here for a second. Um, we'll make an SSBO. By making, let's just make some, some GPU array, which has no information in it. It's one long and it's using this type. So it's going to have one, one bar with a hundred ints available. So there, done. Right. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to make an SSBO from that. So we just do make SSBO and then that, that's done. Uh, we can make a def var called, called SSBO with this. 
Then we can pass this in as a uniform and we can modify it, which is what we are doing here. Oops. Okay, so when we dispatch that, that's gone, but we don't really know when it's finished. And um, so what we can do is we can make a GPU, make a GPU fence. That's now dispatched. And this object, which also needs a print method defined for it, um, we can defvar temp3 that. And then what we can just do is we can say, has the GPU fence signaled? It has, which means um, that the compute shader is finished. Basically what happens is the compute draw call goes into the queue, um, the fence goes into the queue, and they both and they both pass through. So once the, the draw call, the, sorry, once the compute um, execution is finished, the fence is gonna get um, evaluated. That's when it's signaled, um, which means as long as like, so anything that happens before the fence, anything you did before the fence will have already finished by the time your fence is signaled. This is signaled, which means everything's ready, which means everything's been written into that SSBO. So if we go now and just call pull G on this, we will get our data back and we can see the problem, the uh, layout issues that we have in Kepler right now. So that's that. So that's as, probably as much as I have to show on compute right now, just because I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> it's not a stage I've ever worked with before. So that's going to be really cool to... We'll end up doing streams on it. We'll have to do a bunch of research and see where it's applicable. But yeah, we can do... We can turf more computation over to the GPU. And with features that I'm going to add in the future, uh, this is this is kind of where I'm getting. I'm trying to get a lot, as much of the base done, so I can get some of the really exciting newer features, which are the they're they're under the title ASDO, which is approaching zero driver overhead, and it's all about how because GL actually provides a lot of sanity checks when you're doing things, like hey, I want to draw this, and it's going to make sure that that data is say if you say oh i'm going to draw from this texture well it's going to make sure that that texture is ready to go basically it's going to do loads of checks and things like vulcan do almost no checks unless you specifically request them um love like semtest love like semtex is saying compute fractals mandelbrot that would be a great exercise man we should totally do that and we can yeah we should also try and find stuff that we can't do in the fragment shader and definitely needs Actually, that might be quite a good one because that's kind of no. I don't know. Yeah, we'll we'll do something like that for sure. I lost my train of thought. What was I saying? I, you were so right, and I distracted myself. Um, where was I? Oh yeah, Asdo stuff. There are all kinds of cool new features that are available that, that relax the rules. But, oh yeah, Vulcan um, being very lax on rules unless you explicitly do checks. There are things that make GL more like that. There are things that allow you to, rather than, well, some of them are just cool. Some of them like bindless textures means you don't have to bind textures. Um, they are, the textures are available and you can just pass up an integer instead and use that as a texture handle, which is great, which means you don't have any state changes when bind, like big, from binding textures. That's a big performance win. You also have control over what data from a texture is actually on the GPU so you can allocate, a, say, like a 10 gigabyte texture, like a huge texture, and then only make parts of it actually present on the GPU. And you can use this for streaming in and removing data. So you can say, hey, make this part resident, which is the same, actually make this data available on the GPU. Oh, and then pull that back out again. Don't do that. Like just until so you, you're able to page in and out this kind of stuff. And with the kind of tools that are there, um, this is called sparse arrays you can start make, basically making large allocators for yourself on the GPU. And there's so many combinations mm, me. and techniques that you can achieve once you have that kind of control. Again, it's not important for just noodling around, but it could be very useful in making something more high-end. And so again, I, I want to support that. I want, I want the whole thing. I don't want someone to come to Kepler and say, oh, that's really cool, but if I want to do X, then I'm going to have to ditch all this Lisp stuff and go over to C++ where I can actually use it. What's the other things? Oh yeah, um, you instead of doing, like say we had to do 10 different draw calls, rather than 
making all those 10 draw calls in a row, we can make a just a, an array in C which describes the 10 draw calls and then send them as a batch. And this is better because there's a, there's a number of sanity checks that need to be made and if they're batched together, there's just a lot less overhead on the driver for doing those kind of things. Um, also, these these um, these draw arrays don't have to be from the CPU. They could be in they could be in a GPU buffer, which means then you can use compute to fill in that buffer. So you can use the GPU to make the draw calls to to fill in the data for the draw calls that you then make. So then no, there is no round trip from the CPU to the GPU. There's no waiting, which is just fucking mind blowing. So um. There's all kinds of things for making things really fast. Arakode is talking about, is posted slides from the famous Asdo talk. That's yes, Cass Everett one. That's it. There's a GDC um, video from that. In fact, I'm going to go get that now because it's just the it's just the best goddamn talk. I, I have that on um, all the time because it's just like my wish list of features. Asdo um, GDC. Dum dum dum. Come on, GDC Vault, this will be it. I think this is the one. I've got stuff blocked on my machine right now, so I'm, I can't see if that's the right one, but it looks like it. Great talk, really worth watching. So yeah, all of that stuff I wanna get into Kebel. And it's really beneficial, like, okay, so these things are great for any language, but in a language where we have a bit more overhead because we're dynamic, like just the more that our costs per line of code are slightly higher than in some other languages. So any time that we can turf things off, we can batch things. Um, like I just think we can. I think we we benefit as a dynamic language more from doing the batching than even something like C plus plus does. It sounds kind of weird. I, I'm not sure if that's entirely right, but I mean just our FFI calls can be quite expensive. If we can batch things together and make less of them, that's a good thing. If we can just, yeah, if we can just leverage these things so we can spend more time just running Lisp code for interesting stuff, that would be cool. So yeah, that's where I want to get. I want to get the whole set of features. And then we just play around with Keppel and, yeah, make things. Good move, Jace. You want me to ramble about stuff for something like 15, 20 minutes, and now it is half past nine, which was the time I wanted to finish. So I am sorry that uh, we didn't get to um, actually do rendering from the Atlas. That's how it is. It means I've got some bugs to fix in Keppel, and I'm happy to go and do those. So I'm hoping that in the next couple of weeks, I will have some fixes in master for that. They will all roll out um, early next year. So I think we might be doing one or two more episodes before I disappear for Christmas. And then, uh, yeah, that's a lot, basically. So thank you very much for coming. Um, thanks for asking questions, and I will catch you next time. As soon as I can be on the right machine and click this button. Whoa!